So that's our first two kind of measurements here. Now, if we go down, let's do two other things. Instead of measuring the current as a result, uh, and I should say there's actually here two, two dependent variables. Um, and so the first of those was the current, which, by the way, we can view that as simply just the number of electrons released, as long as we understand that that's what current is, or the number of electrons released. And the second thing here that, um, that I should have included from the outset is the energy of each electron. So somehow or another, in our ammeter in that circuit, we have a way to measure the exact energy of each electron as it passes. And by the way, what is that called? <laughs> That's called a, um, a, a, a battery. So you can put a, a, a potentiometer there, and as long as you, you, you can, uh, or sorry, you, you put a, a voltage supply going the other direction, and if there's a current flowing that way, you change the, the increase the voltage to go that way until it balances. And then so if it's an electron, if it undergoes a voltage jump of X amount, the energy it loses or gains is Q times that, that voltage amount. So don't worry about that. All, the, all we care about is based on the energy of, of uh, based on measurements we can make, we can in fact measure the energy of the electrons. So um, we'll call that E. Yeah. So that's what we're gonna do here. E per electron. Now, these are going to be in small, small magnitudes, and again, I'm not drawing exactly, you know, like the, the numbers here, but here's the results we get now. So, first of all, in this measurement, if we begin with, and, and by the way, actually, let's, let's take a, a minute here, and if you have any predictions on these, how, much en how the energy will respond to the frequency of light, and how the energy of the electron will respond to the intensity of light. So, pencil in what you think the results are going to be here. And I'll be back in a second. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about exactly what we find now. So what we're going to do again, we're going to go through the range of frequencies, but this time we're measuring the energy of the electrons. So for this one here, it doesn't really make sense. If there's that new critical here, it doesn't make sense to, to make measurements at uh, a frequency below that because we know there's an absence of electrons if there's an absence of current. So I'm just going to put an X there. That doesn't matter. But what we do know is starting at new critical again, that energy per electron begins at essentially zero or the smallest measurable amount that we can see if you have current. And then now gradually as you go up linearly, again, it looks exactly the same as above. And again, it's a slope that no matter what intensity we have used, and this is a really interesting thing as well, the slope is the same every time we do this, no matter how we set it up. And by, this, by the way, the same, um, the same is true that critical, that new critical is the same every time we set it up as well. However, here's an interesting, like, extra piece of the puzzle. Turns out that as long as you're using the same setup, that new critical doesn't change. But what does change it is if you were to replace, say, a copper slab, a, a copper conductor, with, for example, a silver conductor. Or you replace that with a, a semiconductor, um, silicon, something like that. So depending on what metal you are using, that absolutely it absolutely will change that new critical. So I'm not going to write that in there, but that absolutely is true that the, the metal you use determines where new critical is. I, I will write that in fact. And it turns out, well, I don't want to give it away, but, but you can kind of begin to think what that actually might mean now. And then specifically, when we go over here, if we now measure the energy of every particle, again, we're going to assume that nu is greater than nu, nu critical. So it doesn't make sense to measure, again, the energy of electrons that aren't moving. 
So you take some value greater than new critical, and even at the lowest current that you can, that, that lowest intensity you can achieve, the first, the, the, the tiniest amount of light possible, your measurement is going to be some pretty high value. And this is what I was confusing earlier. As you turn that current up, you keep getting the same value. Turns out that no matter what you do with that intensity, low intensity, high intensity, as the electrons rush, rush past you, they're not going to have any more energy than at the lowest amount of light possible. And this to me is one of the weirdest ones. That no matter whether you're using a, you know, 10,000 kilowatt, you know, like, you know, um, uh, stadium light, or whether you're using a little like LED flashlight, you're going to get the same exact uh, energy as long as you're both operating at the same frequency. So this is a really strange one here. So that intensity does not affect the energy. It's only the wavelength that can affect the energy. And the only thing that can affect that critical wavelength is the material but the amount of intensity you apply does tell you how much current you get out in the end. Not how much energy per electron, but how much current. Um, really, I should have gone in this order here. So um, I kind of like viewing it like this here. So anyway, um, this is where we're at here. This is the experimental basis, and this is really everything Einstein had to go from. Now, he had two other things. He had, for example, the slope of these lines and, and actual measurements, of, like real data. So um, specifically, I just want to give this slope a name here, and I'm going to just arbitrarily write this as, as long as we're using the correct units here, I'm going to write the slope here as h. Yeah. Nah, you know what, let's write as m for now. The traditional, the traditional way that we write slope, uh, y equals mx plus b. So, and also that's kind of true because it was Max Planck, essentially, that was one of the other main contributors to understand this effect here. Um, so th this was absolutely not just Einstein. He, he was the first one to credit this as, you know, kind of based on the whole of the state of science at the time. Um, okay, so what does this all mean here? Let's put together and see exactly what assumptions Einstein made and how he explained this model and especially like this oddity here, and this oddity, what does that physically mean?